Salam. Welcome back. We are in chapter 16 in the book of Yehoshua. As we continued from last time in chapter 15, we saw the divisions of the land of Eretz Yisrael. Up until this point, there's been seven years of conquest of the land of Eretz Yisrael. Now we start the seven years of division amongst the tribes. We started off in chapter 15 with the tribe of Judah. A tremendous amount of land mass equaling all the other tribes. Uh, today, the chapter opens up and tells us this is the lot of the children of Joseph. And it went out from the Jordan at Jericho to the waters of Jericho to the east, to the wilderness that goes up to Jericho and to the mountains until Bethel. That entire area fell into the land of the children of Joseph. So seemingly over here, the text opens up and teaches us that the two major tribes, the two major players amongst the Jewish people, Yehuda and Yosef, they will be the first ones to uh, inherit their portions in the land of Eretz Israel. Just like we have the two energies amongst us continuously, the two Mashiachim, the Mashiach of David, the Mashiach of Yosef, uh, continuously coming to uh, bring redemption to the Jewish people. So too, the text opens up here with the divisions of the lands between Yehuda and Yosef. The, tri the text tells us over here of places that we are familiar with even to this very day. We have Atarot right outside Yerushalayim. Today it is actually a, the original Atarot is in the Arab village, uh, not far from where Atarot, the modern Atarot is. The text in verse number 3 tells us of the place of Beit Choron. The Gvul went to Beit Choron HaTakton, the lower Beit Choron. The text tells us of an upper Beit Choron and a lower Beit Choron. Now Beit Choron we are already familiar with because historically we have already seen in the book of Yoshua in chapter 10, if you recall over there, that the major battle between the Imerites and the Jewish people took place over there and Yoshua ran after them until the place of Beit Horon. So this is an historical place where the major battle took place against the five kings, and Yoshua and the Jewish people were victorious in their battle against the Amorites. If you recall over there, the great miracle that occurred, and that is uh, rocks and boulders from heaven fell upon the enemy over here in Beit Horon. It is also at this place that Yoshua prays to God in order to cause the sun to stand still and in this particular location over here the sun and the moon stand still so daylight could continue for the Jewish people to continue chasing after their enemies until we were victorious so these great miracles happened in Beit Choron Beit Choron the upper Beit Choron and lower Beit Choron is always a, is also an historical place it's an important place it's on the by road the main road leading up to Yerushalayim so historically we see that the Canaanites stayed on that place and wanted it to control that place we also see later on in the time of Shaul the first king of Israel that they came to wage battle against Shaul and the Jewish people at Beit Choron later on we see it in the time of the Greeks with uh, the, uh, the uh, general of Assyria uh, the Greek general, where he was ambushed by the Maccabees, Judah Maccabees, and Judah Maccabee, uh, using the terrain to his advantage, came down from the hilltops on the on the army of the of the Greeks, and was victorious against them in one of his victories uh, that led up to the celebration of the holiday of Hanukkah. We see the Romans uh, had, a, had an important interest in this place, and of course later on. The Crusaders, in their uh, holy mission to conquer and to uh, purify the Holy Land with Richard the, the Lionhearted, came up through Beit Choron until the entrance of Jerusalem. So this was a very historical and important uh, road over here, an important place that uh, was, was immensely important in order for it to be conquered and to control the entire area over there. And it too fell into the lots of the children of uh, Joseph. As I mentioned before, one of the beautiful aspects of Eretz Israel today is that uh, the Arab villages that we know of today continue to ring the names of the ancient uh, Jewish cities which settled over here. So which goes back to show us that the roots of the land of Eretz Israel 
really belonged to the Jewish people. So today, in near the area of, of modern-day Beit Koron, which is outside of Yerushalayim, outside of Givat Ze'ev, we find two uh, Arab villages. One is called Beit uh, Or El Tachta, which is the uh, lower Beit Haron, and we also find the upper Beit Haron about a mile apart from each other. And this was the actual site of where Beit Haron actually stood. And you find that throughout the entire country, wherever you go, you see biblical names which are incorporated into the Arabs' names. When the Arabs came in their conquest of the land of Eretz Israel, they didn't put new names in, but they continued the old uh, Jewish names which were here from the time of Yoshua ben Nun. We continue over here in this chapter, and it comes on to teach us other places which fell into the part of the tribe of, uh, of Yosef. The borders of the children of Ephraim, it goes on, and the text tells us in verse number 4, the children of Yosef were Manasseh and Ephraim, and as, as, as we know, uh, Yosef uh, merited to two portions in the land of Eretz Israel, Manasseh and Ephraim, as opposed to the other tribes, which just had a single portion in the land of Eretz Israel. So they basically had a double portion, which were incorporated both of Yosef's children, Manasseh and Ephraim. The text goes on to teach us over here uh, that their portion fell into uh, their portion fell a gvul hamizrachi. The border in the eastward went out to Taanat Shiloh. When, of course, we're reminded about Shiloh, which was the first uh, place where the tabernacle eventually settled there, and it rested in the area of Shiloh, which is an inheritance of Joseph for 360 nine years before finally being destroyed by the Philistines in the time of Eli HaKohen. And the name of it is called over here Tanat ta, ta Shiloh, which is the area surrounding Sh uh, Shiloh. Rashi over here tells us that this was the furthest point in Shiloh where a person was allowed to eat from the Maase Sheni. That's the byproducts that he used to bring up to the area of the tabernacle in order to partake of his fruits uh, which he was obligated to do so if a person had uh, had had fields and trees 10 percent of his uh, produce would have to be brought up to Shiloh and later on to Yerushalayim when the base of Migdash stood and during those years he had to eat it inside the wall city of Yerushalayim, but before that into Shiloh. So this this area over here that's listed was the 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 extension that a person was allowed to partake of these fruits and still be able to see uh, Shiloh itself, the tabernacle of Shiloh at that particular point over there. And people, uh, when they passed it, would mourn and sigh, ta'anat. They would say, "Ah, oh, with pain," and they remembered that this was the place, the outermost border of Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, and they longed for those days after the destruction of the tabernacle in Shiloh. The uh, chapter, which is relatively a small chapter over here, goes on to teach us and finishes that uh, this is the inhabitants of the inheritance of the children of Ephraim according to their families, and they separated cities for the children of Ephraim amongst the inher inher inherited of the children of Manasseh, all the cities and all their villages. But they did not, the last, the, uh, the last sentence over here tells us, they did not drive out the Canaanites that, dwe that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites who dwelt there amongst Ephraim to this day. And they became servants and paid taxes to the Jewish people. Uh, th so so ends chapter 16 over here. Interesting enough that uh, we find in the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, the commandment which was given to Joshua and the children of Israel upon entering the land of Eretz Israel, which we've spoken about on numerous occasions at the beginning of the book of Joshua, told us that the, ter the Torah commands us, Lo kol nishama, out of the seven nations who lived in the land of Canaan at the time, the commandment by God was not to allow any of them to live. They all had to be killed. But here we see, amongst the children of Ephraim, that they did not drive them out. Now, for, for numbers of reasons that we could just uh, uh, theorize today about why they weren't thrown uh, killed as the Torah commands them to be done, but why were they were left 
as, uh, as, as people who would now be servants and to pay taxes to the Jewish people. One could say that maybe they needed them for uh, work, to do their heavy-duty work. Jews, as we know, are really not crazy about actually building and construction. So maybe they had these Canaanite people that they left to live and they left to dwell amongst them uh, to do their heavy-duty work and to pay tribute and to, and, and to be servants to them. That's one uh, theory that we could, we, we could suggest why they didn't fulfill God's commandment. In any case, they left pockets of these inhabitants of the seven nations amongst them. Now, all the time that the Jewish people had the upper hand and they were afraid of us and they saw the great miracles that occurred in the conquest of the seven years, uh, they knew their place and they stayed quietly where they were. But as soon as the Jewish people started to uh, reap the benefits of the land and became fat, uh, these pockets of Canaanites of the seven nations who lived there rebelled against the Jewish people and made life for the Jewish people uh, intolerable at times and uh, placed bombs on, 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 on various locations and uh, did terrorist attacks against those people uh, of the Jewish people during the times of the tribes. And it became so bad, as we'll see in the book of Judges later on, that uh, actually Israel started to uh, be subservient to them instead of the opposite of uh, a way, way around. So we see over here that even Yoshua, the great master Yoshua, the, the student of Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, didn't finish the job that he was supposed to do and didn't clean house as he was commanded to do to wipe out the seven nations. And he left pockets of these seven nations around. True, uh, they were subservient to the Jewish people and they did pay taxes as is supposed to be for, the, uh, for, for people who were left in Eretz Israel. But in this particular case, because these were part of the seven nations, they should have been totally wiped out, which they weren't. And uh, later they would rebel against the Jewish people themselves. We find that this went on for many, many years, even in the time of David HaMelech, King David, some 400 years later, we would still find this problem. King David, the mighty warrior, goes and conquers Syria. But he still doesn't clean house. He still leaves the pockets of the Canaanites in Eretz Yisrael, although he did extend the borders of, uh, of Eretz Yisrael later on. This was a tremendous mistake, as I pointed out, because this just comes back to uh, bite us in our rear end and to cause us much troubles later on. We will continue next time with chapter 17 and chapter 18 as we continue the uh, division of the rest of the tribes of Israel.